Okay, so uh, back to contact predictions. So Gunnar already hinted that it has been huge progress in contact predictions in the last couple of years. And I will try to give you a talk telling you a bit about the background and actually the reason why it's important. This will be the repetition of what, what we have done in earlier talks also, but there's a few points I want to make. And of course we know that the number of protein sequences as well as the number of structures are, are increasing. So this is PDB, is the red one here. And you see it's much higher here than here. Well, at least that's actually true, but it's uh, hard to see. On the other hand, the number of sequences in EMBL, in Tremble, or in GeneBank, has increased a lot. This is, well, a few years ago, 20 million. Nowadays, it's 40, 50 million, 60 million. Uh, and uh, well, Swiss processes are actually increasing also, but that's another data. On the other hand, but if you do it in log scale, numbers, it's actually both are increasing, you can see it. It was in 2098, it was 10,000, now it's 100,000. This was uh, uh, 100,000, and now uh, this was also 100,000, and now it's 10 million or something like that. So, but it's, it's, well, it's, it's exponentially, it's still, the gap is increasing, but not that much. On the other hand, if we know those from protein families, I haven't talked so much about it yet, but we'll talk about more about tomorrow, and we have the PFAM database. So if you actually look at the PFAM database, the number of uh, uh, protein families, so you have here is the number of protein families, so it's also increasing. And this is how much of unipot it covers. So since 2003, it covers about 75%. So three quarters of all those sequences are covered by PFAM. And today PFAM is 14,000 families, but here it was 10,000. And it was a big increase one summer because there had a lot of master students working there. But otherwise, it's been quite flat. It might increase, but it's a linear increase, not much, and this is flat. So what, what does this mean? We have a slow increase in number of families. We have a huge increase in number of sequences. So that means that each family gets bigger and bigger. So if you have to look at the average size of a family in, in PFAM per year, it started at something like 50, because that was the minimum you could do, you didn't do it for things like that, and it was 100, 100, and then suddenly it started being 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 1,000. So we have many, many examples of proteins from the same family. And obviously we should be able to use this information somehow. And what we do is we use it for contact predictions. So this actually started the whole paper. The whole, whole idea here is actually from the Fisurev E paper in uh, 1999, I think it is. It was a couple other papers, but by a guy called Lapides. Yeah. And um, but nobody read the paper, so it doesn't really matter. Then there was a couple of papers in 2009, 2010. They did protein protein interaction predictions, they predicted the rest of the protein alignments. They, they, they have and using co evolution, they call it. And this is, this, this is one paper called Disentangling Direct from Indirect Co evolution. So these papers are, and then the key papers then that was really released was in 2011. There was uh, Deborah Marx and uh, another Martin White paper, more or less at the same time. And then there was a Cell paper 2012, and from then on, there are many papers. And the key idea here is basically something, it's an old idea. It's that we take the sequence, we do a prediction of the contacts. So we're asking what two residues are in contact. And then we use this to make a model of the protein. And it's not that hard to imagine that if you have a good contact map, so this is contact map, so this is sequence against itself, and every dot here is contact, and this green and red and blue are in different colors, just. So if you have a quantum map, it's not, this part shouldn't be that difficult. It's basically NMR. So we do an NMR. I wouldn't say it's trivial, and it can be a problem, but in general, at least when a first approximation wouldn't be that bad. At least if this is good enough. So how can we do this? And this the idea is also old. It's from the mid-90s by Chris Sanders and co-workers. So you have multiple six alignments. 
And you look for two, so this is from our early study of Muslim psychology, you can look for two positions. In that position and that position. And if you have a cool evolution, meaning that you have big amino acids here and small here, and then you have small here and big here, for instance, or a positive negative charge, like this. you basically have when one of them change, the other one change also. That is the indication that it should be in contact. Because of what may just you, you can just imagine that, the, that you fit. So basically, you can think about it like this: you have a sequence that is well nicely folded protein. You have a contact here between these residues here. And you have a mutation. Of course, this contact is not going to happen anymore. It's going to be, I mean, if you change from a big amino acid to a small amino acid to a positive charge, negative charge, that mutation will happen. But maybe it's not completely killing the organism, but it's but it, 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 like that's make happy. Which means then that you have a drive to make mutations over here. So you have a compensating mutation. So you have this packing nicely again. So this is so if you find any multiple six alignments, you should be able to detect positions when this one evolves and this one also evolves at the same time, or at least very close in, in evolution time. So if you have big multiple six alignments, you can find these things, you can find a statistical signal, and you can basically measure the correlation between every pair of residues. However, there's one problem. You see this red dot up here. This change here actually changes not only this interaction. It also changes the interaction up here. So you have something happening here. It's also interacting. And that means that you probably have mutation here also. But then you will see a correlation between this position down there and the green one. <coughs> Although they are not in direct contact. So they are indirect couplings, you can call them. So, these two are not nicely interacted. So basically you want to find the direct couplings, but not the indirect ones. So A is not B and C, but not A, C is an indirect ones. So you want to dis disentangle it. And it's hard to do from, a, from the, you can't really do it from the correlated mutation alone. Even if you take, oh, we only take the strongest ones, you will be the direct ones. That's not the case, because these things are a network of things together, and you can actually have, from, it can be even that the indirect ones are stronger than the correct ones. So you need you need to have a global physical model. There's something that actually describes. I see this correlation. What is the best model to to describe it? And the first method to do that was published in '99, but nobody read it. So, but now there are a number of methods to do it, and you have to compensate for lots of statistical errors, etc., etc., and so on. Um, but in general, you can say, okay, I see these three correlations here. Is it so that A interact with B and B with C, or is it that A is interact and B and C is interact, etc.? You can try these things and you can generate a possible model. And the methods have been much better. In the beginning, the methods were quite computationally expensive. You can do it with large proteins, etc., but nowadays they actually are quite good at it. So, we started doing some work here some, some, some years ago. And the first thing we did when we were a bit new to this, we, we asked, well, how good are these methods and what is the best method? So this is, and this also can simplify, work as an example of how good different methods are and what has happened. So this is a protein. The gray dots here are is a contact map. So this is the context for this protein. You see, there are a lot of contexts. You can see they have a nice pattern, so they are, they're not completely random, but you see nice context. And the red ones here and blue ones, they are the predicted contacts. In this case, we predict one contact for each residue, which is less than the number of contacts that exist, but it's a good number. And here we use just the correlated mutations, basically the direct information, We're using a mutual information in this case, another measurement, same thing. And you see that basically all, all the contacts we predict are like in one corner over here, there are clusters here, mm. and the blue ones happen to be correct and the red ones are wrong. And the green ones are intermediate, I think, but so a few ones are correct, one, but most of them doesn't really have a lot of information. There are no contacts up here in the outside of the far right of the diagonal, and the ones that actually are are wrong. Well, this one happens to be correct, but you you, you couldn't really think about taking these green, blue, and, red, and blue and red dots to make a good model. But then next we tried one of these methods, which is called mean field DSA. In this case, it's actually not that good. Actually, uh, this is the old prediction, this is the new one. 
Actually, no, the accuracy is not so much higher, but you see, you have many more predictions that are far away from diagonal. It just happens to be in slightly wrong place. This is we shift a little bit here, so something is maybe not perfect, but they're not, they're not that good, but they're not that bad either. But it's slightly better. But we take our other methods, in general, this method is better, but we take another method called, it's called Psycho Development of Jones, and suddenly you can see that things are going good there. So now we have 52, half the contents of the contents are correct. And half are wrong still, but you see you have this, for instance, this interaction over here is all there. You can see that you have contacts here predicted almost all over it. Are these loops that don't have any contacts, but you have even between all these beta sheets here, you have nice contacts, and between the hills is there, and between these hills and sheets is that you have contacts predicted. And uh, ah, you have some noise also in other places, but in general, you have a lot of these diagonals are very nice predicted, and it's and it's something that you could imagine that if you choose this contact, you probably should be able to make a model. Uh, we took another method, in this case, PLM DCA, which is a continuation DCA method. That is even slightly better. On average, this is slightly better than the cycle. But, and you see that the contents are a bit different. They are less red. The red ones here are clustered around the diagonal, but the, almost all the all the correct predictions are, all the long distance contents are, 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 are correct. And you see the content maps are spread out quite nicely all over the space also. So yes, as an example of what, what we can do with this is that we, we, we played around with this a little bit. And it's not obvious that th these kind of predictions, the key concept here, which I didn't tell you, is that you have to make it work. You need very big multiple sequence alignments. You need thousands of sequences aligned to each other. And of course, you can generate these multiple sequence alignments, as you know, with different methods. And uh, using different cutoffs, so you're seeing different. And, you, and there are also these methods that are pretty like the Sidecom and PLM have different uh, regularizations and representations of different methods. They're so different statistical models. But they are, the idea is similar, but it, Presentation is different. So the first thing we did was to develop what we call uh, P cos C for P cos contact. And so we did this, we actually generated eight different alignments using the method that worked best, which was in this case not the multiple sequence alignment methods, because they multiple sequence alignment method cannot handle 10,000 sequences. They just crash, or most of them. So we used HH bleach or jackhammer, which are Basically, side blast, but better metal side blast using proper, proper alignments. So, we used these two, uh, two methods, and then we used two different methods, and then we did 16 predictions. So, we used four, we used four HSB and four jackhammer using just different E value cutoffs. And then we used 16 predictions. And so, then, then we used some machine learning method. In this case, we used a machine learning method called random forest. Uh, I don't think in this case it really mattered because it was whatever. It was easy. But a random forest is basically a set of rules that you have, you have a set of rules that the student who did this liked it. But in this case, I don't think it would matter. In the next example, I think it matters, but not in this one. So, of course, we showed that this worked better. So, this is actually. If you see the improvement of different methods here, you see this one doesn't even start at zero, it starts at 0 0.3, it has to make things confusing. This is, and this is the number of correct predictions given number of, of contacts predicted. So this is one contact per residue, and this is half contact per residue, so, and so divided by the length of the proteins. And this is a set of 150 proteins only. So this is how state of the art in 2008. This is uh, what we did, people did in 2010, and this is then we could combine these things together and we jump up there. But clearly, you jump from having basically not a single correct, well, a few percent correct, to have a 50% correct predictions on average in this data set. And of course, it's a huge difference as shown in the math to have a 20% to 50% correct. So in this case, actually, in this example we have, we have from 58% to 70% correct predictions. And you can see, well, you can't really see that there, but there are a few more contents there, not correct. Right. 
Den vi har till oss kan vi då ge en bättre. And one thing, if you look at the content map, how are the contents distributed? Do you think that they, are they just random or just no? They have nice patterns. So content maps are a lot of diagonal patterns. I mean, well, there's some few single contacts out here and here. So generally, there are lots of diagonals of different sizes. It depends on what cutoffs you use, etc. and so on, but there are diagonals in both ways. And there are clusters. Really, really context likes to be close to other contacts, and particularly along the diagonals. That's just how it truly looks like. You have a to be the sheet together, of course. If you just do 1 and 2 are in contact, 1 and 10 in contact, 2 and 11 also are in contact if they are parallel. Or if the other way around, it's going to be 1 and 5 and 15 are in contact. 4 and 13 also will be in contact. And alpha helix is not exactly the way every, every rescue, but it's every third rescue. So you're going to have kind of diagonal patterns, or, or yeah, then you're going to have some loop things that are clustered together. Like that. So you see, contacts like to be in close to contacts. So you can actually look at it statistically. Maybe. Uh, by just taking the simplest, simplest quantum map, this is a 3 by 3 map. So you look at, you take one of these contact maps, and you take one, two, three, that's three part there. And you take them all together from, from known protein structures. And you can divide them into two groups. One that has a contact in the middle, and one who does not have a contact in the middle. And then you ask, how, what, what are the most frequent patterns I can find? And if you ha do not have a contact map, you find the most frequent pattern is nothing. Then you have one there, 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 one there. You can turn it more once. You have two there, two there, two there. For some reason, these are happen. And here, of course, it seems similar. If you turn on the map, the most frequent one is to have nothing around it. But then it's to have the one force there. But then it's not the ones that are up in the corners. Instead, it's these four contacts and four contacts and three or or three extra and two extra and two extra and two extra. So clearly, this shows that there are some preference, in particular have these like four contacts like that in the corner. And of course you can, you can do this for bigger um, patterns also, and that is, um, <coughs> or you can put it together, but you can look, do it for bigger windows also. But if, if, if you start, start with this 3x3 map, you can see the just frequency, how common is this, and then you can take all the ones that have one together, how common are these, and all the ones that have two together, and you see quite a big difference. So if you have not the count in the middle, the most frequency is, is the ones that have Look at this all, and it's almost everything like that. To have one other contact is less than uh, 3%, I guess this is 3%. Three, three so 97% or 96% when you have so no other contacts. On the contact, if you take this one, because you always have one contact, because you can't have less than one if you have one in the middle, you find that it's about 10% to have no other contacts, and then there's another 10% <coughs> that has two, two contacts that's sort of on the So it's kind of, kind of flat distribution, it's very, very different pattern if you have no con a contact middle up to basically this full nine you don't this last week but even eight contacts out of nine possible ones and this is of course something that machines are perfect and recognize you got teach this machine learning so you basically do a machine learning method that does something like this it the same thing as before we add a few other things and then you do a pretty context and you use this as an input to the next layer so you keep on iterating between your contacts so if you see that you have a lot of pretty contents next to it, you can keep on doing that. And we do this random forest, which I think might matter in this case, but that's a bit different. So in the first layer here, this is a contact prediction map. Well, it doesn't look that bad. It's 36 times correct, but you see a lot of simple random things over here. It has uh, something correct here and something correct here, but it's missing things. But already in the first layer, you see, some, so we use this then as an input to the next layer, together with other data. And then we can do this, you see, you have more contacts here than you have here. And you have, this, for instance, this one has disappeared, doesn't exist anymore. Some of the other ones are still there, but not all. And in the next layer, you see most, more fewer things go down. And in the third layer, you get fewer and fewer. And in the fourth layer, you basically have everything, more or less, here. You know, now this has a few random parts here. These are almost full, completely full. 
So by using a combination then of these me methods, we can do better predictions. So and we can actually look at the accuracy for different family sizes. So here we have the number, the size of the families, number sequences, well, number effective sequences, which is kind of a better measure, but it's, it's a smaller number. And then this is the average number of correct predictions if you do one prediction per residue. So these are the other methods. This is a PCON C, but this is a PLM and PSYCOV, and this is the one is PCON C. So we do slightly better there in this field, particularly between 100 and 1,000 effective sequences. But you can see that we, the new PCON C2 jumps quite a lot already with 100 sequences. And somehow, by experience, if you have a PPV value of 0.5 or better, we basically have uh, mm, uh, we can make a good model. This is just experience telling us that. So, because in this area we do a quite big jump. On the other hand, in this area down here we still pretty bad. So if you have less than 100 sequences, 100 effective sequences, maybe it's normally 500 sequences, we still pretty bad. But if we look at uh, old methods that are not used with direct measures, indirect measures, they actually much better also here. So this is master of 5C map as approved, they are actually much better down here. And uh, so therefore we developed a third method, PCON C3, that actually uses one of these methods of 5C map in this case as an input. It actually also uses only one one, one method for PCON context. Oh, I told you because my only one alignment. But, but otherwise it's the same idea. And this method jumps in performance in this area over here. So this is the brown method here compared to the red one. Over here is basically the same, but here it's better. Okay, so this is uh, what you can do. But then you need to make models. Basically what we do and what other people do is also basically we take these predicted contacts and put them to Rosetta. It's extra constraints. And we can show that we have uh, if you have a better content map, you get better models. This is a measure of models quality. This is a measure of uh, the correctness of ma content map. It's not a perfect one to one correlation, but it's clearly it's correlation. And particularly, David Baker has done some very impressive work here. And uh, they use, well, they use much more CPU time than we have, but they're also, they're using Rosetta. And uh, their content method is called Gremlin, it's basically the same as PLMDCA. But uh, they have, uh, uh, they, 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 this is the measure of quality of the model. And this is their energy, it's basically how, how, good, how good is the model fulfilling the, the contacts. So, so, if you have, so how, ma how many of the contacts you predict are fulfilled by the model. And the red one down here is the native one, so this has an energy of minus 860 something like that. And then they do, uh, normally they do just Rosetta by default, they end up somewhere here, so it's not that good, it's like 0.3 quality, which is not that impressive. But then they use some new tricks, which basically combine a lot of different fragments and things together, and they can get on there, and they can actually even continue doing that that they did afterwards. At the end, they end up with this model. So one of these models is actually a correct one, and one is a native structure. A model and one is a native structure. I have no idea which one is which, but they're basically spot on. This RMSD is 2.6 angstrom. It's um, 25 residues. It's 0.6 to 68 in quality measures. And they have, what they have done later, I should just show you the... the uh, Let me just show you, they have published two papers. No. no. So they have... Uh, mm. So this is one of the papers. Uh, well, they have a later paper for memory also. 
So in this case, they went through this pipeline for every protein that had enough sequences. They make a good model. So this is actually this is the model that they did blindly and the CASP showed that the method worked. It's target 0806. And I guess that uh, uh, one of these is the model, one of the native structure. I don't know which one you want to say. And it's another target. This is less, this is more, but it's a less impressive. This is really spot on. So they showed that the method works. And then they went through every protein family that had enough sequences and ha didn't have a known structure. So ended up with predictions of all these proteins. And at least. Most likely, most of them, or not, not all of them, are correct. Uh, so this is, this actually, these are really the memory proteins, but I have another one without, which is solid proteins also. And they, it's an order of 100 proteins on that. So this is, this is a memory channel, the good report was, so you can actually have a model there. And this is, of course, the accuracy of these are most likely comparable to an NMR structure, and some of the proteins are much bigger than you can do with NMR. So, if you take it from the PFAM level, so in PFAM we had 14,000 sequences, 14,000 families, and about half of them, or a little bit less than half of them, you have a structure representative form, so half of them you can model easily. So, two-thirds of the structure, and if you assume that you need a few hundred sequences, effective sequences, for a good model, then you would end up with something like that. So basically, of the 8,000 you couldn't model, if you need 1,000 effective systems, you can, you can make models of 3,000 families. If you need 100, you can do for another at least 3,000. And then there are another 2,000 that are probably are that you cannot do any models for today. But it means that we can basically, from the family perspective, we can basically go from having 40% to having almost like 8% coverage by computational modeling. And out of this, out of this down here, the Baker has done a few hundred. So there's still some work to be done, but it, 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 that should be within the reach. And, yeah. So that's the progress that has happened in the last couple of years. Okay. Is that considered the solution then?